All right, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, two packages that are inside Scikit, the Scikit HEP project, um, particles and the K language. Uh, so we'll start uh, with Eduardo, he'll cover the, the basics of the two packages, and then I'll do some live demos uh, at the end. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. All right, so we can start this thing. So in it, we'll be talking about the two part, uh, the packages which are called particle uh, and decay language. Uh, I have a quick word on on Psyche Hub project itself. So so some of you may have may know that we have this project with, that uh, is a community driven, community oriented, and includes a set of uh, not so small by now set of packages, including these these two guys. Uh, it tries to improve interoperability between Hub tools and scientific ecosystem in Python in general. It also tries to build a community, developers and end users and to improve the scalability of these things. And certainly four, four keywords to, uh, to have in mind are collaboration, reproducibility, interoperability, and also sustainability of the software, because otherwise if, you know, if, it, if it has a very short lifetime, that defeats a bit the purpose of having a community project like that. So now, starting with a, uh, a presentation of the particle package. So this is around the particle data group, uh, particle data and identification codes. Um, okay, motivation. The, uh, the PDG provides a downloadable table with particle masses, widths, and charges, and also Monte Carlo uh, uh, PDG IDs. Uh, you can have a link there for the uh, most recent one from 2018. There's an update coming probably reasonably soon. Um, they also provided, this is not widely known, an, an experimental file with extension information such as spin, quark content, and all various parses and some other things but only until late 2018, eight, sorry, so this is a, a, a while back. Now, anyone wanting to use these data for uh, you know, all kinds of things, and we will certainly show many examples of applications, uh, they will have to parse this programmatically themselves. So why not try and make something that is, a, is hopefully professional, efficient, and also versatile for, for everybody. Uh, so this is one part of the, uh, the motivation. The other one is uh, connected is, is that you have this C++ libraries have PID and PDT that provide, among other things, functions to process PDG IDs and all kinds of art other particle ID codes used uh, in Pythia, EVTJ, and some other uh, Monte Carlo generators as well. And unfortunately, there are different IDs and they, you have to have a matching between them because there's no, not a one-to-one. -one. Well, well, they have different, different numbers for the, uh, for the same particles, that's what I meant. And uh, so again, why not try and make this available to everybody uh, in a, you know, once and for all, so to speak. Okay, so an overview of the package. Right now, you have a fair amount of things you can see from this busy slide. Uh, so there's two, par there's two parts again. So the Pythonic interface to this PDG particle data table and the, uh, the identification codes with some extra goodies. So these make two separate uh, models or sub-models of the package if you want. And then um, something to... Uh, to process and acquire the PDG IDs. Uh, so there's you know, no lookup table needed here at this stage. You can just produce them uh, as, as a little class as we see in a second. And this, should we should say, you know, it's based on the latest version of this of the C++ class is there, although it has some extensions and minor fixes because these, these two C++ class classes have also been around since, uh, since a decade, I think. Now, so in, in terms of functionality, okay, there's a PG ID class. There's also some functions to acquire the PG IDs, and I'll give you a few examples, and, and the Harry will show much more in, in, in life. So, uh, okay, so the other, thing, the other part is the, uh, a simple natural API to deal with, with the particle data table, so for properties in general, and this, this table provides queries, but also uh, powerful searches uh, so, and lookup uh, utilities. Uh, this goes around the particle class, and so also some, I should have said, PG as well, a part called named intro, so you can programmatically do things, you know, use names that make, make sense and rather than having to, to have a, a variable A for, for a pi plus, for example, it's not as much sense. This is all provided. One thing that we really were careful about is that typical queries, even if they are quite powerful and quite flexible, they should be one-liners, really. And we also provide some, some more uh, advanced tools uh, for conversion, particularly between uh, uh, different things also to extend if you wanted to, to define particles as this is done in fact in, in the second package uh, decay language. Uh, the other thing we should mention is we have comprehensive documentation doc strings in, in the code itself and we're quite serious about continuous integration in here it's not just about checking the code but also checking the physics that is behind the things so you know, if w w physically if that makes that makes sense what is what is spitting out. 
So for that, we use, we use Azure DevOps, which gives us the CIs on the, on, the, on the three major platforms for free and, and very naturally and you know, very, very easily accessible. Okay, so I've been discussing these data files, so they, they, are, they are stored there and available when you uh, pip install the package. Uh, they contain the, the original PDG files, which are in a fixed, for, with fixed width uh, format. And, but of course, we, to make it more easy for acquiring, we, we have a digestive form of these folks where we also add some, some extra bits of information such as LaTeX names, again, to make it easy for the user. Uh, we do have the latest one and also a couple of ones from the past if you ever wanted to, to check differences. Uh, kind of information that is in there in this di digested file is, is, is shown uh, for, uh, for a few of the uh, Charmonium states. They also so other files, such as this CSV file that just does the matching between the PAG identification codes and LaTeX names of all the particles. So, yeah. So, PAG identification codes, um, so the PAG class uh, is, is the wrapper about around these, all these PAG IDs. It behaves like a int, but as I said, there's a few extra goodies. So we can ask you a few extra uh, things. Uh, if you want to have an overview of everything, it can uh, answer as a question, so to speak, you can use this info method that provides a long list. There's a, do, there's a dot there, just basically around the f 20 uh, properties that you can give. Some of them are obvious. Here in the case of the proton, you see that even the A, of course, is one, which of course for leptons and so on is, is not relevant, but it's still there. Uh, on the right, you have a, a, few, a few examples. I will not go through all of them one by one just because the demo will be far more discreet. The only thing I wanted to mention here is that uh, towards the bottom there, you can see that if you give it a, a nonsense PDG ID, then it actually t tells it immediately when you, when you look at the class uh, instance that it's, it's not valid. Uh, and, and also you have all the, all the, the functions that, that are the queries. They are also available as a standalone functions uh, in, in, the, in the package. Okay, next slide. Uh, as I said, we have literals to make it uh, easily, easy to programmatically use in, in, in all kinds of plotting, for example. This is more relevant for particles, but you also have them for PDG IDs there. You can see, you know, you can, you can trivially uh, get hold of a, of a pi plus a PDG ID and, and you, can, you can query just as before. You say, okay, I have my lambda B0 literal. It has button, of course, it has a button and, and so on. And there's this self-consistency. So if you query, I'm projecting ahead of the next thing with the particle class, there's a full match, of course, between the literal uh, say PDG ID and, and the one that you get from, from inquiring the data table. Um, okay, so going on now to the, uh, the particle lookups, so really looking at uh, inquiring the, the contents of the data table, the PDG data tables, uh, so you can import the uh, particle class and then you, most of the time you will, you will acquire from a PDG ID name, otherwise you can, you can also do it from the name or some very sophisticated uh, queries that will be exposed in, in the future. So there's a few from methods, but mostly uh, you know, from PDG ID is one, an easy way of creating a, a particle. Just for fun, I was also showing that you can display all kinds of things, such as the, uh, the representation of, the, of the, the particle. So it gives you the name, the PDG ID, and also the mass. And you can, you can use it for, again, for like plotting and so on. You can, you can get hold uh, very easily of the LaTeX or the HTML, HTML and names. Okay, and again, as I said, you have the literals that allow you to, uh, to, to, use, to have a, a, a nice name to, to manipulate all the, all the particle instances, and hence their properties and so on. Uh, I've been saying that we have a, a powerful particle search. So how does that work? We have two methods for that. Uh, one is find and one for, find, is find all. The only difference is find is, is looking for one match, and it, it does raise an exception if you find several ones, so in principle, if you're really looking, you're doing searching, you, you probably use find all, unless you, really, if you know exactly what you want there. Uh, and you can quite, uh, say, for example, uh, ask describe to have an, an overview of what is inside the particle. You see there's a name, PGID, LaTeX name, all kinds of internal quantum numbers, also the mass and lifetime, it can be lifetime or the width, depending on the value, actually, this is done programmatically. Also, some other quark contents, this, this, the type, whether it's a vector particle, pseudoscalar, anything. And it has a few things. This is quite, it is a neat way, an easy way to get an overview of, a, of the information from one particle. Uh, there will be lots of examples of, with variants in, in the demo, so I won't go through it in, in much of detail, but just, just to show that something like, imagine you want to know what are the pseudoscalar uh, charge, charge mesons. So this is one line, you can find all of them. 
where the PGID is a meson, which it has charm, and the spin type is uh, uh, pseudoscalar, and it gives you all of these pseudoscalars. Okay, on the command line, you can also do a few searches. This will, this uh, Henry will show, so I can skip. But in again, again, you know, it, this is trivially done on the command line. You don't have to. Uh, that you know, have the two variants to do. Um, okay, feature directions of the package. Uh, so first of all, uh, we want to add other particle IDs that are relevant to uh, and names that are relevant to other Monte Carlo programs, such as uh, you know we already mentioned that Giant, Pythia, in fact, EVTGen have their own uh, schemes. So to know consistent themselves and we need a translation, it would be nice to have them. Uh, in here so you can then make use of everything that is available, but whether you start from a PGG ID or a PTO or whatever, that becomes uh, just, uh, you know, flexible. And then bring other communities where particle is and or can, can be relevant. In fact, we already have some discussions with, uh, with other particle physicists where we, they would like to extend all of these features to then make use of their particle IDs for Monte Carlo programs that we don't know too much in, in LHC, certainly like EPOS, Corsica and so on. I have a few names there just to show that it's not one or two cases, but actually quite a few. There's also some ongoing discussions with the PEG uh, group itself, being extremely useful and helpful. So, so stay tuned there for any news. Okay, so that was it for the uh, the particle package, and now I have a few slides also on the decay language package, which focuses on parsing decay files and also describing and converting particle decay representations. I'll come back. So uh, motivation, okay, we, uh, to have the ability to describe decay tree-like uh, structures and uh, also provide translation be between decay amplitude models between uh, various packages. Two examples are AmpGen and, and GooFit, certainly used in LGB. So AmpGen uh, does fitting and generation for multi-body multi particle decays using this so-called isobar model. GooFit is, is a general purpose uh, fitting framework in C++ and, and Python, especially oriented to GPUs. So it's it actually quite quite nice that you can talk to each other in a, in, a, in, a, in a much much easier way than was not available in the past. So you can, in particular, you can actually generate uh, goofy code uh, from with the decay language package. Uh, another point is that uh, any, any experiment, of course, uses many event generators, and one of the things that they have to do, uh, by definition, is to describe the uh, particle decay chains. So going beyond particles, are actually decay, so particles. Uh, certainly, programs such as EZTGen, which we have a using heavily uh, using uh, flavor physics experiments, use these so-called uh, doc deck decay files. And so, why not try and make a package that to deal with these things in, in the same way that we did for uh, particles themselves? Okay. So, an overview. This is very much work in progress. We have to say it's not as much as uh, as uh, ready as particle, but okay, still very much relevant. Presented here. It, we have some tools to to, to do the translations and also to parse decay files. So starting with these conversions and representations, as I mentioned, uh, this is just a snapshot here um, from, a, um, from a class to, to read an AmpGen file. You have this, this little file, if you, in this case, can be much more complicated than that, of course. Uh, that you, know, you see there's different decays, but also there's lots of various bits of information that you would like to, to use to build your model properly, and you can, of course, get hold of the information there, and you see that it, it makes use of particle to get hold of the particles themselves, but then it spits out complicated code that uh, the Harry will show, so we not show anything here. It's, it's, it's worth doing in a live demo. Uh, okay. Uh, I mentioned decay files, so what do they look like? Okay. Experiments such as LHB, uh, Clear in the past, uh, Belt, and so on, they have this master decay.dec file, which is a big guy uh, that defines all the decay modes for every single particle you, you want to, um, to, to, let, to, to let decay in your Monte Carlo problem going beyond the standard decays that are known to Pythia, and sometimes you actually want to override those to have something more, more specific. Uh, so this, in LHB, for example, this is a big file by now. It's over 450 particle decays. There's thousands of decay modes, literally. In fact, the file is, is over 11,000 uh, lines of, of uh, code, so it's not, it's not tiny at all. And when you, then on top of that, you have you, the user decay files, the small bits where you want to say, okay, now I want to generate uh, my specifically, in this case, a BC plus uh, decay going to BS pi and, and, and the BS going to KK. So I just specify that, that, that bit and everything else is decay generically with you making use of the big master file decay.dec. 
So these are the, the various types of decay files that exist. There's lots of things decay, defining the decays themselves, also lazy, lay aliases for particle names, uh, specifications, uh, charge conjugates, matching between the, the say the, the particle and antiparticle, and so on. There's other, other verbs as well that get complicated there. Okay. Um, so it, it is quite impressive that you can actually uh, parse the whole shebang with the with a, with a parser, with a, with a grammar that is the holes in kind of 20-ish lines here. So this is, is done in our package with the help of uh, this powerful Lark uh, parser. You see the grammar in this, this snapshot. So you, you, can, you can go through it and see that there's things to, to uh, look at decays, charge conjugate decays, aliases, and so on. So the whole grammar is there, if not that line. And as I said, this is enough to, to get hold of and manipulate all the information in the decay files. So how does that look like in, in practice? So imagine you have this little uh, user decay file of a uh, vstar mode going into uh, to various d, d pi's or d gammas and where you have the sub decays defined for the d's and also the pi zero there. Um, so, so it basically it's, it's three lines of code from, from import. So you import the class, do this, you specify which input you want and you, and you then parse it in, in one line. And once you have done this thing, you can, you can query all bits of information that are in the k file, uh, the k particles, mothers and anything branching fractions and so on. And although this is very much win whip, but also we, want, we wanted to show a kind of uh, representation that you could plot from, from a decay chain. Whereas here on the fly, just to make it a bit easier to display, we say, okay, uh, make as if the d plus and the d zero are, are um, stable. So only show me the sub decay of the pi zero, which is the four legs that you see on the right there on the plot. But is, is, and you, with all the branching fractions from the decay modes, you can see where we're getting. You can you can make it more complex, but it's a nice way of visualizing things, and you can also make use of that to to uh, actually make some studies. Uh, one one thing again, like like for parsing, like the, like for particle, uh, we really want to make things a one line basically. So we, the parsing should be, should be simple, and also the priors are on top of the information that you have parsed. Okay, so feature directions, uh, we want to implement more backends. So for example, you could spit out the uh, Goofy code in Python, whereas for the moment it, this is done in C++. And in the longer term, you can also implement decay logic inside the model description, so you can you can you can, you can know a little bit more the program when it spits out the uh, the models for the fitting problems. Actually, knows a little bit more what it is, not just a string, but something that is that the string is representing. So this is a work in progress for the future, certainly a uh, longer term. Uh, I mentioned that once you have parsed the decay files, you can you can acquire all kinds of information. One of the things that that are pretty neat is imagine you have you have all the information there. You would like to say, okay, uh, uh, let me know. Can I can I know all the uh, decay chains possible that get at the very end, say, uh, two k ends and two pi ends, possibly with an extra pi zero, just because I don't see in, in, in my detector. And you know, th this could be uh, given as probably tens of possibilities of getting to this final state. Some other ones are different business. So this is the kind of things that you could do again in, in one line once you have that mission. And and once you do that. Uh, you would like to visualize certain parts, of certain decay trees, and this is something that also work in progress. In fact, we already have customers to to, to use that visualization of decays with a, with something that is, you know, by, by itself it doesn't at that stage is not specific to to the decay files, but it's something generic. Just how to do do you visualize a, a decay tree, a decay chain? Okay, so uh, a few links at the very end, just to say that both of these packages are on GitHub on. Uh, the releases are, are there uh, with, with the links to, to PyPy and also the, if you want to get in touch particularly for the project itself, you have the, the links at the very bottom of the page. So, uh, and we will move on to the interactive demos. Thank you. Okay, so unless there are any burning questions, I'm just going to go on to the, uh, <coughs> the demo section. We'll have plenty of time for questions after that. And just a moment. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off with, with demos. If you do want to follow along, you can. You can just do get this um, notebook from the link that I posted on the uh, Indigo description. And uh, it will assume that you've done a uh, pip install particle. 
but otherwise should not have any other dependencies besides the, the notebook itself. Uh, and uh, the demos will be entirely in Python 3, but um, there's no particular uh, requirement that, that that be true. I just uh, find that to be a bit more um, natural. There. Okay. So, so far we are still supporting Python 2. So first we're going to take a look at the command line usage. So we're, we are starting off with Particle. Uh, and as Eduardo said, there are two modules in Particle. There's the PDGID. This does um, as much, this pulls as much information as possible out of the PDGID number without doing any uh, table lookups. And then there's the Particle um, module itself, for which that package is named. And uh, that's the one that has the uh, built-in PDG tables and does various search manipulations and display. So on the command line, you can just uh, say Python dash m particle, so that's the particle module. And um, we can just do dash h here to take a look at the help. You'll see that there are two uh, modules, a search as well as a PDG ID. Um, and you can also check the version. So uh, I'm using particle 0.4.4 for these demos. So let's take a look at each of these two, um, these two possible commands. We'll start with the PDG ID. So for example, if we ask um, for the, a PDG ID of 210, you'll see a long list of all of the things that it might possibly know about um, the PDG ID of 211. Like I said, 210, 211. Um, so you can see the um, charge here. You can see the absolute value. There's all of these things could be queried um, in the, the Python mode as that PDG ID dot this thing. Okay, and it's a, a long list that goes off the screen here. So if we take a look at particle, with particle we can do the same sort of a thing. We can ask, we can again give the number 211, but this time we get uh, all the information that it knows about inside particle. So we get the LaTeX name, we get the uh, actual, the um, programmatic name here, we have mass, width, et cetera, every, everything that it knows about that particle from the PDG data tables. Um, we can ask, we can also do a search. So for example, I can ask for a search of uh, pi zero and uh, you know, we get, I'm sorry, pi plus, and then we get everything that has, that would match a, a pi plus. Um, and we can uh, specify a specific one of these um, as well. And if we do, let's give myself a little bit more room there. Uh, if we do that, we get the same same output from the search string if there's only one result. Uh, this is something that's quite new. It was added today. Um, there's now a uh, zip app version. So this is a single file that uh, you can just take and you can run it on any computer that has Python on it, um, two or three. And you just take this, you take this and you can run it. You can run it with Python or run it or uh, execute it itself. And uh, it holds the entire particle command line program inside. So uh, there's a little bit of trickery that, that uh, goes on behind the scenes to make all this work, but uh, it should work pretty much um, anywhere. The command line mode may be expanded a bit to make it a bit more useful as a, as a tool that you can access from bash scripts and things. So if you're interested in that, uh, feel free to get in touch with us and, and talk about the, the possible future of that. Okay, so and then for um, the rest of the demo, we're going to be looking at Python usage. So uh, we're going to do an import. We're going to import PDG particle charge. We'll be looking at all of those things a little later. Let's take a look here first at the PDG ID. So this is um, creating a new PDG ID object for 211. And if you take a look at it, that's the uh, representation. And if we ask for .info, you'll see again this nice long list of all the different things it, it uh, as that it knows about. And uh, I can just do p dot, and then um, you'll see a variety of different things here. So um, has down, that's true. So all of these things are, are uh, available in this, in this p object. Okay, there are also literals. So um, these are actually dynamically generated from a, a list that's stored inside uh, particle, and it, they generate the exact same list for uh, both 
PDG IDs and particles. So it's a, coherent, a consistent interface. So uh, here I'm just going to take the PDG ID literals. It doesn't actually construct these objects uh, until you import it. And then once you import it, PDG literals dot, and then you'll see that there's a, a long list here of, of literals that uh, are available. So if I just pick one, you can see that that's the um, PDG ID for that. It's a complete PDG ID object. Let's take a look at particle. There are quite a few different ways to make a particle. Uh, you can just make one from the PDG ID. So there's a, a factory function here from PDG ID that um, creates a particle from the PDG ID. So there's the, the, uh, the particle there. They have smart representations in notebooks. Um, you can do it from the literals. Again, the part, there's the, a, a particle subpackage of literals. And uh, if we do that, we get the exact same list of literals. So I've got this the same list here. So one of the most powerful tools in particle is this find. So find will force a single uh, result. Uh, it's safe to use inside a, um, a script because um, it will throw an error if you don't get exactly one result. So the phi 1020 there, for example, does give you the phi 1020. Um, and by default, this, this uh, first argument here is just a, a um, fuzzy string search against the particle name. But you can actually specify any, any particle property you want. Um, you can specify those either as keywords. So here I, I'm going to search by LaTeX name. And the LaTeX name, I'm looking for the LaTeX name of phi 1020, and it finds just, again, that one particle. Uh, I can actually also um, mix these things. So I can search for any pi that um, anything that has pi in the name that also has a uh, charge of minus one. So that's the list of all those. Um, you also can use uh, enums for several of these properties, such as for charge. Um, the uh, actual property here that's, that's important is really the three charge, three times the charge, because that's an integer. So you can uh, just compare that with um, charge.p. So that would be the positive charge. There's uh, several different ones here, so minus, minus, plus, plus, et cetera. So those are now the positive um, pions. You can also use a lambda function to get a full, full flexibility in your search. So um, for example, if you wanted to take a look uh, through all the particles that it knows about and find uh, a, something where a collection of different properties was true, then you can just say lambda p, and then you just build your logic out of the, the p, and it will go over all of the um, particles, it will feed each one into the lambda and return just the results that match your query. So in this case, I'm looking for particles that have a bottom quark that are neutral and have a mass between a nice narrow range here, 5.2 and 5.3. And uh, that's the, the bees there. And uh, feel free to play with this a bit. You can change the, change the range and things to see how, um, oops. That obviously won't find anything because it's an empty range. Um, but you can see it. Uh, nice ways to quickly uh, do these sorts of searches. Here's another lambda function example. We're looking for very long-lived particles, something that lives over a thousand seconds, um, where these, this, these units are things I just grabbed from the HEP units package, which is included with particle, uh, and with many of the other scikit HEP packages. And uh, you see here I have a list of the uh, long-lived particles. And I could, in fact, um, just look for all the particles that have a infinite lifetime. So, uh, and then I can go back to using my keywords instead of using writing lambda functions if you want. So this is the, the keyword version. Again, if you'd like to see that, if you'd like to change that to the lambda function, you would just change, say, lambda p, p dot lifetime. And uh, equals. Uh, is equal to infinity. So that would be exactly the same uh, search as before. There are several different display methods. You've already seen a few of those. Uh, the particle itself has a nice Jupyter Notebook display if you're in a, a Jupyter Notebook. If you're not in a Jupyter Notebook, you see the uh, wrapper, which is this, this uh, string here. And you can, of course, always print it if you want. And then if you print it, you get sort of this uh, PDG ID na um, style name. Uh, over here, very similar to what you'd see inside the 
PDG files. If you'd like to see a full, the full description, which you've seen a few times already from the command line, that's this, p.describe, returns a string and you can just print that. And uh, it sort of tries to describe as much as it knows about that particular particle. Um, you also have access to LaTeX names or HTML names. So you'll see that, for example, D0, this is what it looks like in LaTeX and this is what it looks like in uh, HTML. And the HTML is actually used in other places such as um, libraries like Decay Language where they're trying to build some of these nice um, representations out of your particles. You can do natural things to particles. For example, you can take the inverse of a particle. And you see you got a, a, D, a D0 bar there. Um, there's a large number of different properties, so you can look at the spin type. Most of them are smart enums, so not only does it behave like a minus one, but it actually is also the enum uh, pseudoscalar enum, so you can easily read what that is just from looking at it. Um, but it is an, it's, it's an int enum, so it compares like an integer. Uh, and there's, there's quite a few different properties if you take a look. Um, there are, are quite a few. charge. Okay. So there's the charge or the three charge which will be a integer. Okay. So you can quickly access the PDG ID of a particle. So that's the, uh, you can do dot PDG or you can just hand these over to a, the PDG ID constructor and that will do the same thing. You get this PDG ID object. So I've sort of taken you through some of the basic things you can do with particle. There are others. There are other things you can extend or replace the default particle table. Um, you don't have to use the one that uh, is loaded by default. You can keep from loading it entirely if you want. Um, you can adjust the, the properties for particles if you'd like to see what happens if you adjust the mass of one, one particle or the width of something. Um, and you can also make your own custom particles through the um, by hand if you'd like. So let's instead take a look at one of the uh, users of particles. The particle does have some nice user facing functionality, but it's also really designed to be used inside other packages to provide um, sort of this, the, uh, this sorts of PDG information so that the, these other packages can be more intelligent than they could be otherwise. So we're going to switch over to decay language. All right, so this is decay language. Uh, this one is under uh, fairly heavy development. You probably should be on the master version um, in order to to run these demos. Um, as uh, we're, st we're still uh, developing large portions of this. So as a quick recap, Decay Language is really designed to uh, support manipulating decay structures in Python, uh, whatever those those might be. It really started with a specific focus, but it was always intended to, to be generalized. So it was first de uh, designed to take in the uh, amp gen grammar, which is a very nice way of describing amplitude, um, amplitudes and amplitude analysis. And uh, to then to convert that into an internal representation in, the, um, in Python, and then to output something such as goof at C++, which is currently the only uh, output that's been implemented. But it's designed in such a way that it should be relatively easy to implement different outputs. And then uh, deck files were added later, and uh, they uh, are a, a related, um, at least related from a, a programming standpoint, um, structure, and uh, we gained the ability to read these uh, deck files and manipulate those things in, in Python. So let's first take a look at um, the original uh, original part of decay language, the decay format. So uh, I've got a file here. I'm just going to go ahead and print it out. This is the uh, amp gen format. So you have uh, this, this nice little structure here for defining a decay. You have the event type up here at the top. And then for each of these, you describe using these square brackets and curly brackets. Um, you describe what each how each particle um, um, decays. And then you have in the square brackets, you can have options for what type of decay that is. And then uh, you can specify uh, fixed or free, which is what this number means, um, a real part and imaginary part for the amplitudes. And you can specify a variety of other things such as um, constants and, and uh, fixed constants, floating variables, things like that, um, various properties. So if you had a, 
a K matrix, you could define every element in the matrix, etc. So there's there's um, enough flexibility in the, the syntax to do that. So now we're going to take a uh, take the K language. We'll use the command line mode, and uh, we'll ask ask it to use the GooFit generator for output, and we'll read in um, simple model.txt. And this just produced text uh, text um, as an output that you could then pipe to a file or whatever you want to do with it. So first starts out with this nice uh, comment at the top, um, which describes what it's done. And uh, you'll see that it's actually understanding what's going on here. So it, it's figuring out what the, the appropriate spin, um, spin factors are based on what sorts of particles are decaying into what sorts of particles. Uh, it knows what, what each of these things are, whether they're vectors, or scalars, et cetera. Um, and uh, tells you which spin configurations it's discovered, which ones GooFit is um, able to understand. And then here's the actual code. So from those eight or so lines of code that we just saw, you see that we're creating um, a variety of different variables. Many of these things come from the from particle. It's using particle quite heavily here. And uh, it's outputting uh, each of these amplitudes. And it's, bu it's building all of these things out of their um, out of the proper parts, along with occasional comments telling you what it's doing and what the original amp gen line looked like. Um, so that was sort of the, the original um, motivation. Another thing that it can do, uh, you can access this from the Python as well. So I'm going to read in that same model. And then uh, we're just going to take a look. So it gives you this, the, uh, all the states as well as the different lines. So we'll just take a look at the first line. And uh, this is the, the output. So this is the first, the, the app gen, and this is sort of what it understands to this to be. Again, using the HTML output from particle there to format the, the display. Okay, so let's uh, change gears a little bit, take a look at deck file. This is under uh, heavy development. Some of the things in the syntax may change, but uh, we're gonna show you sort of what we have so far. So I'm just gonna do a couple of imports there. Grab the deck file parser, and we're going to do a little example of this other thing. So let's take a look at um, what one of these deck files looks like. Slightly larger than the screen there. So this is a, just a fairly simple little uh, decay file. And now we're going to read this in with the, uh, the parser. The parser does not parse it by default, so you have to ask it to parse. Um, and so you'll see after you parse it, now it, it uh, knows that it has found five um, decays in that file. So then if we ask it to build a uh, decay chain, you'll see that we have here, you have your D plus, and then you have each of these um, uh, daughters here and what sort of, uh, what the decay modes are, et cetera, for this. So let's uh, take a look at a couple other um, um, ways to print this out to query this information. So here we can print out just the decay modes. And uh, you can see the, the branching fractions and decay modes there. Um, hmm? Decay models. Decay model. And yes, the decay models. Um, here you have the different um, particles in the decay. And here you can see these are the, the different possible decay modes for, from that. You can take a quick look at the charge uh, conjugation feature. Um, so for example, if you take a look internally, this is, uh, we're looking a bit at the internal um, components here of this class, as you might guess from the little underscore there. But uh, you'll see that it has this um, lark parser tree here. Um, specifically take a look at this part. Um, so you have here a, a d star plus. And then if you ask it to uh, do a um, charge conjugate replacement on that tree, you see it's gone through and it's done the uh, charge conjugate. And it's actually used particle to, to look up the um, um, PDG style name. So you'll notice the name now here is now a PDG style name. So if we do it again, it's now switched back to the original decay, but now we have the PDG style names here. So uh, we have the functionality to do things like that to build these charged um, conjugates. And there's some extra um, complications here, such as you can um, specify charged conjugates in the uh, deck file, and it uh, picks up and understands those. So let's try this on a larger file. So this is the uh, decay file from LHCB, which is a, a fairly hefty file. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and run that there. 
And uh, you'll see two things. You'll see that it took about one and a half seconds to do the, uh, to parse that file um, with the charge conjugate decays turned off. And you'll also see that it found a uh, duplicate entry and that's actually a real uh, issue that we're trying to get fixed. This has enabled us to find. If we take a look, you'll see there's 421 um, decays in this file. Let's take a look at a few of the things in there. You can see that there are aliases, so it's, it picked up those and, and uh, parsed those aliases. You'll see that um, that whenever you write one of these, that you are, that's an alias for this other one, and it built that dictionary of, of aliases, uh, and it also builds a dictionary of the um, charge conjugates that you um, specify as well. So these are the charge conjugate dictionary. Okay, so that's a look at both decay language and particle. Uh, decay language is still under um, heavy development. Feel free to follow the development or help contribute. Tell us what, what you need, what you'd like to see it uh, be able to do. Um, we're still working on the uh, some performance issues and on the general API and, and how one would uh, interact with, with decay language. Our particle is um, significantly more stable at this point. We're ready for people to be using it. And uh, we're uh, trying to, to find areas and places where we can polish things off. And the, the development of decay language is helping to do a bit of extra polish as well. So now with that, do, do you have any questions? Um, I have a question. Um, this is sort of a big picture question, but uh, so decay language, I had been wondering if it was a uh, a new language for describing decay trees, but my understanding now is that it's a uh, parser and compiler for uh, various pre-existing decay languages, AmpGen and decay.dec being two of them. Is yes. that right? Yes. The, um, it doesn't try to really invent its own decay language, though its own mm -hmm. internal representation, it builds it builds a tree internally, and that, in a way, is yeah. sort of its decay language. But it's not really meant to be a, uh, um, at least at this point, it's not meant to be something a user would really program them in themselves. They would probably write an amp gen file, um, mm -hmm. or an amp gen style syntax, uh, or um, a deck file. Yeah, okay. It's meant to be able to convert between these representations more than actually make, trying to make a, a yet another new one. Yeah, so, so that yeah. so do, that means it's a new, uh, new compiler, right? Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, just, just say well, one of the things <laughs> by, by, by these conversions that you have is imagine you wanted to benchmark uh, at some point to fitting packages that do, that do models, and if you had this thing spitting out buffet code or some other I don't know, that fit code or anything like that, you could actually do a benchmarking in, in a more easily, easy way for comparing mm -hmm. things. So that's also something you gain by, by extracting away a little bit. And then, and then yeah, there's the other component that, that has this, this uh, easy representation of decay chains. So you could, you, could, you could make in principle anything with it. So that can be used indeed for the, for the parsing of the decay files. You can, you can make these, these, these uh, amplitude models. You, can, you could probably, oh, you can visualize the decay chains as well. And I'm sure somebody will come up with some other uh, use cases which we we mm -hmm. eager to to hear about. Well, useful. Um, sorry. So sort of on Jim's point, uh, I mean the that this is actually one language, right? This is the DT Gem uh, specification. Uh, is that would it be imagined to, for example, with an interface to you know, the Pythio way of thinking about things, which is, which is different. I, be, I believe the answer is yes. Um, and in hopefully, again, sort of like with the original de the decay, the decay language, um, that the internal representation would end up being the same and you would just have a different, you'd have sort of a different input. But yeah. I'm, not as familiar, I'm not as familiar with the Pythio know what you're referring to, but I'm, I'm not as familiar with what its structure looks like. Is, isn't this already too, because AmpGen is another language? Well, 
so I'm trying trying to see where this lies. It's this sounds like some kind of a LLVM for particle trees. That is somewhat the idea. Mm -hmm. That it would have, you know, there would be it would allow you to convert basically between these. And to, and give you tools, not just not just the conversion, but also the tools. Like to, if you want to query it yourself, if you want to to um, yeah. do some things that are not trivial to, to uh, search for, given the original file. Mm -hmm. so, so you mentioned Pythio. Was somebody else mentioning Pythio? I think Pythio uses a gigantic XML file. So in principle, you, you could you could you know yes. spit this thing in the XML. And uh, so as I know, the the Pythio file is very much out of date, so you could imagine that for anything generic that you would like to decay via PT, you could, you could in fact reproduce a uh, up-to-date or an LHEB most up-to-date equivalent for, for PT out of this thing. So that, that's the thing. We haven't thought about it, just thinking out loud now that you mention it, but that's something that is possible. Right? It, was, it was less a question of possible than whether it was planned. <laughs> no, it was not planned. <laughs> we hadn't thought about it. I mean, the idea was for it to be a general package, but it's, I mean, hopefully we'll get people who, you know, if someone comes in and is really interested in Pythia, then that would absolutely be a, uh, you know, potential case to have that as an output and or input. And, then and if you have a student who wants to do that, we can support them as a Diana or an Iris F fellow. Mm -hmm. so, any contributions are welcome. <laughs> yeah. Try to... By the way, Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll wait. Okay. Just to say, since uh, in fact, when I mentioned that, that we were discussing with an astroparticle physicist, so I, I, I don't know that he actually uses the PTX XML file. Uh, he was interested in using our things just because he was a bit more powerful than what he had in there, and uh, and yeah, also the PGIDs that he uses in other, in other cosmic gray um, generators. So so this is all things that we should dis definitely discuss. Uh, we, we can ask him. Uh, if he would be interested in, uh, in, in that kind of uh, an updated PT file to be seen, but this, yeah. In principle, in any case, these things can go in both directions. Uh, Henry, this is Mike. Uh, remind me, please, at, at one time I thought you had an interface which drew pretty pictures of the decay chains. So you had a Python script that worked from this. Is that Still part of the package, or is that something you did separately? Yes, you saw that briefly in the demos at the end of the. Um, no, there's two of them. So, the for the um, Ampton one, I showed a, an image there briefly during the demos, and then there's a, a variation of that that's working inside um, the deck file, and you see that in the slides, which actually are not being projected. Never mind. Oh, Let me share my screen again. All right, give me just a moment for the video to stop. There we go. So this is the one, this one is not public yet, but uh, this is the sort of the same technology but applied to um, the uh, uh, deck files. So you can see here the branching fractions and, and you're selecting just a particular part of the decay chain. And then in my uh, the demos that I showed, and this one is part of the, the official package. Um, I showed it. Oh, there. So this is the, the picture that uh, Mike is referring to, I believe. But it is important to mention that that in the end, this is just a decay chain. So one of the things that we absolutely want to do is have a representation that can can ingurgitate any anything and then spit out a, a, a fancy a fancy plot with a, oh, information such as branching fractions as you see on the on the plot there, yeah. the color one. So we're hoping I said this was sort of designed to solve a specific problem and is slowly being generalized. So that uh, hopefully that this this code will end up being shared. These two different plots are actually made different um, with the same underlying technology, but they're made in two separate places. Uh, but it would be nice to provide this as something somebody could use. Uh, this is, I think, was uh, an interest of um, Hepton, the PyHemp MC3 project, to be able to easily make these sorts of, of, um, of pictures, but 
from their own, own things, not necessarily reading in an amp gen line or anything like that. Okay, I'm sorry, can you go back to the previous image, the one that you had on a, the, with, with, you know, going left to right in the lower left hand corner, that one. Yeah. So how did you build this particular picture? Is there a simple command inside your the K language package? Is it a something? Is that the, the chain equals P dot and then display the, the decay yeah, chain? Is there a? I think the idea is that there would be basically a, uh, a very simple way to just say chain display or in a Jupyter notebook, it might just be simply chain and then it displays this. But uh, right now, that's I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand is this can an, can a naive user like me, so really naive, generate this plot with one trivial command? It's not public yet, but that's the idea, Mike. Indeed, when you want no, to I, I'm, I'm trying, I, I didn't ask if it's the idea. I asked, does it exist today? Can a naive user simply type a few, you know, minor commands and this pops out? In my laptop, yes, but not public yet. That, that's why I said it's working progress. It's not there because it's, it's, a, it's a proof of concept, but it's not, it's not uh, with, with the proper API. It's not it's part of the distributed easy. package. Yeah, one liner. Yeah, not part yet, but we'll, it this, will be a one-liner, yes. Yes, and this part already is, is there, so I think it will be very similar. So this, this yeah. you know, that all the code to make this, this plot is here, except, of course, the simple model.txt is, yeah. Yeah, I, I showed that up previously. But uh, the idea is I think it would be as roughly as simple to do this with the, you know, is this sort of a situation, just basically one extra line here. Yeah. And then this, this is a, um, development version on Eduardo's laptop, but <laughs> but but the, but the code that is, that is there is is working and that's public. Yes, the, uh, the the hash comment is indeed the one that is private, not yet the, the, on on the repository. I think there are a few other things we're we're trying to finish up here, like the uh, particle name display, etc. Is not not, yeah. not fixed yet. It Ooh. still says gamma rather than the the Greek letter. Mm -hmm. So this is Matt Bellis. I had a, a couple of comments about this uh, and some questions maybe. Um, so first of all, this looks fantastic. This looks, I'm, I'm really excited about the K language. In part, I'm very biased because back around 2010, 2011, I worked with a student to write something very, very similar to this called Pi Decay. And if you Google Pi Decay and look at the images, um, you'll actually see a poster that the student wrote. This was with the bar uh, analysis code. And um, our goal was actually to come at it from a different end. Uh, again, we wanted a language to define uh, decays. And what we were using it for was to actually generate uh, the analysis code that we would use within the bar. Um, so we built it on GraphViz as well. Uh, the student, Jesse Jennings, used the dot language, so this was all built into Python. And I think that, I'm, I'm, I don't think that any of this was by any means lifted from that. I think that we're all kind of converging on similar solutions. Uh, but you can look at the images and you can find, you know, this is again 2010, 2011 graph is not as pretty as it is now. It does not have, um, uh, we did not have Jupyter Notebooks at the time. But again, what we were using is we wanted a language to which you could attach arbitrary values to, um, arbitrary attributes, and then write a, a parser to generate the tickle files that we used within Babar, right? These tickle files were difficult to work with. You didn't have any graphical representation. Um, and then the idea is you could use it to do a lot of other checks. We talked about the idea of using this for some of the Monte Carlo generators. The bar was winding down. This was a summer project, so it never got implemented. But the, the thing we were thinking about a lot, and I'm curious if you discussed this as much, is the idea of using this to actually generate the analysis code that someone might use at some early stage for, let's say, selections and cuts. Like, is there a way to attach arbitrary attributes to uh, some decay chain uh, where you could attach something along the line of cuts that would then be interpreted, let's say, by some of the analysis description languages that are being used, um, some way to check everything, right? The, the thing that's nice about this type of package is, is that it gives you a visual 
a visual check, a visual representation, which makes it much easier to, to bug check. And I'm wondering if that's been any thought, any discussion. Uh, if not, it's something I'm interested in trying to actually use this for. Uh, but if it's already being done, then I, I can get, just get in touch with whomever's doing that. Like, could you use this to generate your analysis code and apply the first order cuts or selections or any of the, the generator information? Uh, that's going further than we've uh, discussed for the most most part. We have discussed the idea of doing sort of these arbitrary ab uh, attributes, and that's part of the sort of the, what we're calling in generalization. Um, okay. That, um, yeah, I, I can also comment a little bit now. Okay, so what, what you what you ask could be could be could certainly work for a few cases. I don't know how far you can go for very complex ones, but for simple ones, I could imagine that. Now, this being said, there's two. To, well, one caveat is that it tends to be immediately very experiment specific. For LHGB, where we have a bunch of, of, uh, of classes that do selections for us and filters and things that are based on what we call the decay descriptors, there you can imagine doing because all, all, quote, quote unquote, all you, can, all you need to do is take these decay chains and, and make the decay string that we use as almost like a plug and play, 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 right. play in our uh, constructors. So that's possible. We haven't tried it at all. But for, as, as again, there are limits, okay, but for cer certain realistic cases, that is actually quite simple. Cool. And yeah, I'll send so you some of the stuff that we did just for fun. Like I said, I think yeah. we're all working in parallel. We're, you know, just for historical uh, information. Yeah. Uh, it's just very, in, it's, I, I love what you've done. It's, it's fantastic. Um, but I'll send you some of the thoughts that we had, the poster that the student put together. Uh, it's interesting That's to see the it. developments of this. I found your GitHub uh, repository, so I've added a star there. Oh, cool, yeah. And you see, like, it hasn't been touched in, like, seven years. <laughs> I went to look at, yeah, it's kind of lane fallow for, for many, I don't even know if the code would work now, but like I said, I'll send you some of the poster stuff. It's uh, yeah, seven years. 2012. Thank you. Yeah, yes, back in the day. I think we originally had it on Google Code or whatever their repository was. Anyways. Yes, cool. Any more links? And the poster would be very, very helpful. Yeah. No, nice stuff. Uh, I have a similar question. Um, could you use the um, maybe decay language to, uh, to generalize or to, to find new decay chains? or to also to, to find decay chains which are not yet in the PPG, but which would be allowed by the standard model? So that's a bit more complicated because these decay chains, they, they are built, at least now, of course, on, on, on these decay files, which the, the master one is, is gigantic. Uh, now that, that, that's going, be, that's re reverse engineering. So you actually take, a, take uh, say particle information, and you, and then you say, well, according to my mass, const mass constraints and certain certain other, uh, uh, well, conservation laws. Then you can, you can, uh, there's again, there's, you know, you could go wild in there, but this has, in principle, that's 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 possible. If, if I could quickly comment on on this, um, so uh, an analogous thing that was done in Clio was actually done exactly for this. That you had. Um, Basically, you took the file, and there was, you know, so, so you'd have so, you'd have all these particles, intermediate resonances that had some set of decays that you tried to populate in some reasonable way, and then you said, okay, what are all the things that a D0 could possibly decay into given the intermediate resonances that are specified, uh, including maybe you throw in some resonances that come from the PDG or whatever, and then you could directly compare um, the final states uh, or intermediate states, depending to what was in the PDG. Uh, so it was definitely a way that of, of tuning uh, when you didn't have the benefit of uh, proper you know, resonance uh, uh, amplitude studies, uh, tuning intermediate uh, substeps. Um, so that was actually something that, uh, that, that, that is something that can be done. It, it requires some attention to the overlap removal of steps where you've been explicitly put in uh, some resonance structure versus where you've um, uh, where you're allowing it to go via some intermediate thing. But 
But, but yeah, just uh, to continue on that, you know, when we when we mentioned here some of the things that you could do in the, in the future, which I'm quite interested in getting this going, it's one of, uh, it, it's not quite what you ask, but it's, it's a, but it's a little bit. Given that information, you know, if we, we if if I give you my final state and I say I I don't care if there's extra pi zeros or whatever, that give me all the all the decay paths possible that get to that to that final state with whatever number of, of decay chains. So. This w once you have the machining, we're not usually far. We just want we need to make this more uh, more efficient and also easier uh, as the representation. That then then you can do it because because you go you go recursively and you check yes do I get my two k's and two pines or whatever yes. So what you say is going one, one extra fur step further, which is on top of this can actually have something that is not there but still possible via exactly the, the reason why I'm asking is. Um, Maybe in, in the new trigger for the, for the LHCB upgrade, we would uh, want to write, um, or we would want to cover uh, as much of the standard model um, allowed decays as possible. And if you could generate 100% of this uh, standard model decays, and then you can then you can check if, if your if your HLC selection mm. covers this or not. Mm. But even already, you should I should say, it, and we definitely want to do this exercise, but. You know, for certain final states, you already with what is in there, you will find a, a very large number of, of rows. At some point, you, you you're down to something that uh, you know almost doesn't happen anymore. Sure. But uh, so, I don't think we're very far. But we keep that in mind. Okay. Are there are there any other questions? All right. Oh, well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, uh, keep an eye on this. Feel free to give us a star on GitHub. And uh, then touch you. So. Yep. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Goodbye.